My name is Omri Gazit. I am the co-founder and CEO of Asserto. Asserto is an authorization company, and you'd be shocked that I'm here talking about fixing broken access control. A little bit about myself. I've been doing software for developers for well over 30 years now. Um, about half of those building cloud platforms at various large companies. Um, a lot of that time on working on identity and access management. This is my third startup. I love startups. And when I'm not startuping, I'm skiing. I also had the pleasure and privilege of working on some really cool projects of my career. So I uh, was one of the co-founders of the .NET project at Microsoft, also of Azure, uh, where I led the Azure Access Control Service and Azure Active Directory, so a lot of the enterprise services in Azure. And over the last 12 years, I've been working on open source, uh, so led uh, some of the OpenStack initiatives at HP, was uh, a board member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, worked on Kubernetes, and most recently uh, on Puppet. Those are my socials, uh, and please feel free to send me email if you have any questions uh, after the talk. So let's first motivate why we're here. Uh, you're, of course, at the OWASP conference, so you all know about the OWASP top 10. And why you care about broken access control is that over the last four years, since uh, the 2017, uh, you know, from 2017 to 2021, uh, broken access control went from number five on the OWASP top 10 to number one. Exhibit B is uh, a more recent survey, uh, the one that came out in January of this year uh, on API security top 10, has broken access control as the number one, number three, and number five uh, vulnerabilities when it comes to application, actually API security. So this is actually a big deal. So we have uh, BOLA, broken object level access control, BOPLA, uh, broken object properties access control, and then uh, BFLA, uh, broken function level access. Those are five of the top 10. Now, if you ask the OWASP people, they'll tell you that 94% of the applications that they test exhibit some form of broken access control. So hopefully I've rested my case. Uh, this is an important topic for us all to uh, get focused on. So let's not actually stay uh, theoretic. Let's get practical. Let's actually see what a broken access control vulnerability looks like. And I'm going to demonstrate through a to-do application. Um, I picked this because this is simple and familiar and easy. This is a Rick and Morty themed uh, to-do application. Anybody know Rick and Morty at all? Yeah, a few of you. OK, I'm a little too old for this, but my kids tell me all about it. So I know, I know a little bit. If I get it wrong, uh, please don't make fun of me. So I'm going to log in as Rick here. Uh, and Rick is our admin. He's an evil genius. Uh, he has all sorts of tasks, for example, uh, attend, Omri's, oops, I should probably spell my name right, uh, Bola, talk, uh, he can uh, gather um, mega seeds, <laughs> I think that's a thing in uh, Rick and Morty, um, and so on and so forth. Now, we can also log in as Morty. Morty is uh, Rick's sidekick, and he is an editor in this application. So Morty is going to, uh, you know, uh, make time crystals. And, oh, sorry. Hmm, interesting. Let me see what I can do about this. Can you see now? Yes, excellent. All right, there's Morty. Thank you so much. Um, great, so um, that's Morty. And Morty can interact with his own to-dos, but he can't actually interact with Rick's to-dos, right? He can't delete them. He can't. Uh, he can't uh, uh, complete them. He's getting 403 errors here. Let me make this a little bigger so everybody can see. Great, so Morty actually wants to be an evil uh, genius in his own right, and he wants to go figure out how to hack uh, Rick's program. So I'm gonna use my visual aid here, become a hacker Morty, and go bring up uh, our uh, Chrome tools here. And let's go see what happens when Morty tries to interact with Rick's to-dos. Okay, he's getting a 403 over here. Interesting. 
Uh, we're going to go look at the payload. Actually, we're going to copy this as a curl. Awesome. Morty's going to go to his handy dandy command uh, terminal window. Uh, he's going to paste this. And he's getting access denied, not surprisingly. But he's going to go look at uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, what, what, what is getting sent here over the wire. Let's try this again so that we can see the whole thing. OK, there's a curl. Uh, we have a uh, to-dos API with what looks like an ID here, uh, with uh, an authorization header, with a bear token. So this is a JWT. Great. Um, oh, but he sees that there's some data here. Uh, and in fact, there's an owner ID that gets passed as part of the payload in the body. So let's see what happens if we actually go and change the owner of this to-do from Rick to Morty, just to see what's up. Morty at the Citadel. Oh my god, the to-do was updated. Wow. So Morty was able to very easily hack Rick's application. Of course, this is a trivial example. I'm no longer Morty the, the, the hacker. I'm going to leave my uh, <laughs> visual aid to the side now. Uh, but you know, this is a trivial example of uh, actually some combination of broken object uh, level access and uh, object properties. Uh, what we were able to do was sniff out the request, figure out that you know, we could, the, the code behind the request was incorrectly trusting some information that was sent by the client application. Client application, uh, as you know, the React application here was doing all the right things, but of course, that's not where you want to enforce uh, that type of logic. You want to enforce it uh, at the API. So let's go back to our presentation here. We're going to have to go back and forth here. Great. So let's go look at what's wrong with the code. Can anybody tell me what's wrong here? This is kind of a very simple, uh, you know, uh, route handler in. Um, Express.js. So we ha basically have a put method that we're handling to do URL with uh, an ID. That's all fine. That's, uh, that's pretty standard. I get the to do out of the body. Um, I get the user typically out of a database. And then I start writing some spaghetti code, right? So I'm going to allow the operation here if uh, the user's role includes an admin role. Now, uh, Morty's not an admin, uh, so he can't do this, but Morty is an editor. And here we go. Here's the offending line of code. Um, the owner ID that we're trying to compare to the key, you know, which is basically, uh, you know, the, the, the subject that we got out of the JWT happens to be coming out of the body of uh, the request. So, you know, pretty straightforward type of uh, logic error. Now, how many of you are developers in the crowd? A lot. How many of you are security engineers? About, you know, a, f a few less, but, you know, let's call it half and half. Now, this is actually kind of hard to find as a security engineer if you think about the entire surface area of your application, right? There are, like, hundreds of these types of route handlers in an average application strewn across many microservices. And so being methodical about how we think about expressing this code is critical. Otherwise, we're ne never going to find them all. And that's why 94% of all the OWASP tested applications experience or exhibit one of, these, uh, one of these vulnerabilities. So how do we do this? I had the pleasure of uh, watching Isabel Mauni um, last week at API World give a talk on the OWASP top 10 for API security. This is the list that just came out this January. And I loved her slide. Uh, addressing BOLA issues, I'll literally read this. The true fix is fine-grained authorization to resource resources in every controller layer. The, so a decision engine is required, preferably external to the code. And you need to be able to enforce something like Gene is allowed to access account 123, but cannot delete or edit it. So can't agree more with Isabel here. Basically, there is no free lunch. There is no panacea. There are going to be a lot of people who you know, have scanners and tell you how to find these things. But in order to fix them, there's actually hard work that you need to do. And specifically, every one of these routes has to have the right logic in it. Now, Isabel actually points, Isabel points us in the right direction. 
Uh, she is basically saying that we want to externalize authorization. And the rest of this talk is going to actually talk about some of the techniques that we can use to mitigate and uh, eliminate some of these broken access control issues. Uh, by the way, if you don't sub subscribe to um, her, the 42 Crunch newsletter, apisecurity.io, you should. Uh, it's a great resource on uh, API security issues. So it's not all bad news. Uh, I would say authorization is finally having its moment. Uh, it's kind of been the sleepy backwater of the overall identity and access space and uh, the security space. But we're starting to see some of the large technology companies not just uh, you know, fix these problems, but also write about how they fix these problems. And specifically, uh, Google started this trend with a paper that they published in 2021, late 2021, so it was about two years ago, uh, called the Zanzibar paper. Um, anybody heard of Zanzibar, Google Zanzibar? A small number. So if you've ever used Google Docs and you basically um, have uh, created a document and you've made somebody a viewer on that document or somebody a, a, a commenter on that document, you've used Google Zanzibar, right? Zanzibar is their planet scale authorization service that 50 different Google services use for, for fine grained authorization. So Google Calendar, Google Cloud, Google Docs, Google Drive, all of those use that. Uh, and that was a fairly seminal paper. It actually informed a couple of other implementations, one uh, from Airbnb called Himeji, and another one called uh, AuthZ from Carta. They're both Zanzibar inspired, and they use what's called a relationship-based access control model. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a second. On the other side of the slide, there are a couple of other vendors, Netflix, Intuit, that wrote their own access control systems, and they talked about them. They use more of an attribute-based access control model. And so um, we can basically look at all of these papers uh, and there are probably at least a dozen more that you can read. And we can abstract some, some, some principles, some what we call the laws of authorization, um, and basically try to uh, you know, implement them in our applications if we want to have uh, a truly robust access control posture. So let me go through uh, these five patterns that we think are really important for uh, solving this problem. And I'll contrast them with uh, what I call the old school or the anti-pattern way of doing things. The first one is that each service does its own authorization, right? So right off the bat, you see that you know, the problem is that we have to go through every single um, API or application and you know, with a fine tooth comb, look through all the code in that API. And that's just you know, not a scalable thing. And of course, a lot of things are going to uh, bleed through. And the modern best practice, not this clicker, this clicker, is to employ a purpose-built authorization service, just like Google did, just like uh, Airbnb did, and all of that. The idea here is to uh, basically treat authorization as a separate concern, just like you treat authentication as a separate concern, just like you treat monitoring as a separate concern, you treat authorization as a separate concern, you delegate it into its own microservice uh, and so now you have something that every other service can call and get robust access control. The second anti-pattern is to bake coarse-grained roles uh, into these applications. And in the logic, you saw that I had this admin role, you know, I had this editor role, and that's actually kind of an anti-pattern these days. What you want is fine-grained access control. And why that's important is the principle of least privilege. This is. Uh, you know, one of the important uh, elements of, of zero trust security, you wanna be able to limit what a user can do to just the set of permissions that they need and no more than that. Because if you have a breached identity, you want the blast radius to be as small as possible. So gone are the days of these coarse grained roles, you wanna be able to employ fine grained access. The third anti-pattern is, like we saw in the code, authorization, what we call spaghetti logic, right? A bunch of if and switch statements that basically encode in that you know, application all of the different rules for authorization. And the modern best practice is to extract all that authorization logic out of the application, as Isabel said, and express it 
in its own domain-specific language, uh, be able to express it as an authorization policy, and store and version it as code, just like you do infrastructure code or application code, you want policy as well. What does that, it, it, that, what does that enable? It enables separation of concerns. The application developers can go focus on application logic, and then the security engineers can actually reason about the entire surface area of the authorization logic of the application. And that, of course, again, enables separation of duties. You can rev the application without having to rev the authorization and vice versa. You can, uh, you can upgrade the authorization policy of the application without having to redeploy the application. And that gives you a ton of agility. The fourth anti-pattern is to treat uh, OAuth scopes as permissions. Who knows what OAuth scopes are? OAuth 2 scopes? Plenty of you, great. So this is a, you know, like a, a, if you use something like Auth0 and you start using their documentation, uh, you'll easily go down a, the wrong path, right? They basically, all their samples say, well, in order to do authorization, all you need to do is to put scopes uh, in the access token as part of the authentication process. And then in the application, just check that the JWT, the access token, has that scope and everything is good. So that's great until it breaks down, right? Like if all you have is admins and regular users, that may actually work. But let's say you have the read document scope inside your access token. What does that mean? Read which document? All the documents? Probably not what you intended. Certainly not what Google Docs intends when you, you know, have read access to a document. Are you gonna actually create a scope for every document that the user has access to at login time? How long is that gonna take? Obviously, that's a completely inappropriate pattern. And it is based on this fallacy that authentication and authorization are the same thing. In fact, they're two different processes, right? Authentication is all about proving that you are who you say you are, authorization about what you can do within the scope of the application. And so the best practice is to separate these things into two different architectural layers, right? So authentication, separate from authorization, and authorization is done in real time, as real time access checks. So this user, does this user have this permission on this resource at this time? And then lastly, um, most applications have login trails, but very few applications will actually capture every decision that the application has made and store, and, uh, store it in, in your logging, your seam system. But that's exactly what you need to do in the age of zero trust and identity breaches, right? Because, you know, it's not a matter of if, it's, ma it's a matter of when, and you need to be able to know what a breached identity has done within your system. You need to have that, for, that level of forensics. Now, every one of your applications really needs to emit that type of decision logs, and you ne need to be able to centralize them and be able to pour over them for compliance and for forensics. So those are the five principles that we can glean from all of those papers that I talked about before. So let's dive into uh, three of them, fine-grained, policy-based, and real-time. And then after that, I will show you how to actually address broken access control in that uh, application, applying these, these principles. So the first one is fine-grained, right? And it turns out that we now have two ecosystems uh, some would say competing ecosystems in the cloud-native world. The first one is the policy as code camp. This is the idea that you extract authorization logic, express it as code in its own domain-specific language. The uh, torch bearer for this camp is the open policy agent project out of the CNCF. Who knows about OPA, open policy agent? A small number, more of you should know about it. Um, Open Policy Agent is now a graduated project out of the CNCF. It graduated about two and a half years ago. Uh, and so it's a fairly mature ecosystem. It's used primarily for infrastructure authorization. So, you know, this is an AppSec conference. And so not, you know, it may not be surprising that uh, not many of you are familiar with OPA, but we're starting to see OPA being used for application security scenarios as well. So it's got a lot going for it. Um, it's a general purpose engine, it's flexible, uh, and it's really tailor-made for the idea of attribute-based access control. So the idea of expressing um, authorization decisions as rules, uh, you know, around user attributes, resource attributes, and environmental attributes. Now, there are also some drawbacks. Uh, the language 
is uh, derived from data log. Data log is uh, an, uh, a cousin of Prolog. So if you like Prolog, then you'll be right at home with uh, Rego. Uh, but it does have a steep learning curve for the rest of us. Uh, it doesn't really give you any help with any kind of authorization patterns. Uh, the strength is also a weakness. It's a general purpose system, and so it has no opinions. So you really have to start from first principles when you design an authorization policy in Rego. And lastly, OPA itself has a good policy plane. It has a good story for how you version policies and how new policies get uh, distributed to uh, an OPA engine, but it doesn't have a data plane. And if you think about authorization, it's a problem that involves both authorization policy and data, right? The data being attributes about users, relationships between users and objects, all of that data needs to be stored somewhere. OPA basically says, problem left to solve for the reader. So the other ecosystem is uh, the Zanzibar ecosystem. I call this the policy is data. Um, ecosystem, and this focuses on a different access control model, the relationship-based access control model. So on the one hand, we have ABAC, attribute-based. On the other hand, we have relationship-based access control. Now, the pluses and minuses are almost flipped here. Um, it is where OPA has no opinions. Zanzibar has plenty of opinions. It's a very opinionated model. And the idea is that you're modeling authorization rules as relationships between subjects and objects. Subjects are users. Objects can be anything like tenants or documents or lists or items uh, or even to-dos as uh, you know, we'll see later on in this example. And relationships are basically uh, things like you know, named relationships. Think of them as almost like roles. So viewer, commenter, editor, owner are the roles that you have on a Google document. And those roles carry permissions like can read, can edit, can comment can delete, uh, can delegate, so on and so forth, right? And so basically the Zanzibar model, the reback model says, a user has access to this resource. If we can walk that graph between these, the, the subject and an object and find a permission, and that graph can actually be fairly, you know, uh, fairly involved. So for example, a user could be part of a group. The group can have viewer access to a folder. The folder can contain a document. And so walking that reback graph means traversing that entire graph, finding uh, a set of edges that carry that permission, uh, and basically validating whether the user has access that way. Now, so if your domain looks a lot like Google Docs, this could be a great model to start from, uh, but there are some drawbacks. It's a fairly young and immature ecosystem. Why? Because Google doesn't have a product called Zanzibar that you could actually go use. Google doesn't have an open source project that they uh, you know, open sourced. They don't even have a spec. What they did was they wrote a technical report. Now the technical report was uh, you know, awesome, just like the MapReduce paper back in, in the day, and just like all the you know, work that they've done on uh, big data and machine learning. Uh, they're very generous with uh, publishing uh, you know, kind of some papers about what they've built, but that's given rise to at least half a dozen open source implementations competing open source implementations. They all have different schema languages, different data languages, so the ecosystem is a little bit Im immature. Um, and it's actually not easy to uh, you know, add attribute-based logic to these uh, reback systems. Now, that's changing. Uh, some of these projects are starting to evolve, but it's still kind of hard to do anything other than the reback model. Now, fortunately, there is uh, a third way, the best of both worlds, I call it, uh, and this is uh, the Topaz project and uh, ones like it. Topaz is an open source project that uh, my company is the primary maintainer of, Asserto is. Uh, it is a, uh, what we call the best of both worlds. So it uses the OPA engine uh, for basically the decision engine, but it brings all the opinions of the Zanzibar model and specifically an embedded database that contains all the users uh, or the subjects, all the objects and relationships between them. So you can actually write policies that uh, reason about both attributes and relationships. So the second principle here is policy-based access management. Now again, as a reminder, this is the idea of lifting the authorization logic out of the application and expressing it in its own domain-specific language, which you can store and version just like application code. 
So here I have a, uh, an example of a, a policy written in Rego. That's the OPA, OPA language. And it basically has a couple of allowed clauses. It basically allows this operation if this user is a member of the evil genius group, or it allows the operation if this user is an editor and the user's key, the subject, is equal to you know, the, the resource ID, the owner ID, the, uh, the owner of the resource that we're trying to uh, manipulate here. And what does that give you in practice? Well, if you extract all that logic that you saw, the if it switch statements, and you express it in an authorization policy, your application code can look really clean. So this is the same Express.js um, uh, uh, route handler that I showed before on, uh, this is actually on get, sorry. Um, different route, uh, but as you can see, there is a check auth z middleware that we put on the dispatch path of this route handler, and that does all the work for us, right? So there are no if or switch statements inside of uh, this, the application. So we've been able to separate those concerns. And what does that give you in practice? You can store and version the policy just like application code, right? Every policy change is logged as part of a git change log. And the policy can be, re can be reasoned about holistically by a security team and decoupled from the application. And lastly, we can actually treat this policy just like we do any other application artifact. These policies are extremely important, right? So you want to practice a secure software supply chain on these policies. You want to be able to build them, tag them, version them, sign them, just like you do any Docker container. You want to be able to do that with policies as well. Just like you do infrastructure as code, just like you do application code, policy as code should be uh, handled the same way. This is a uh, pointer to a project called Open Policy Containers, uh, which is basically a CLI called the Policy CLI that gives you essentially the Docker workflow for being able to build and test and uh, sign and verify signatures of policies. Um, and it's a CNCF sandbox project. The last one is real-time access checks. And this is when I get into my rant about uh, authorization being a distributed systems problem. What do I mean by that? I mean that authorization, if you think about it, has to be a local operation. Why is it that we don't have a service for authorization yet, the same way that we have for Twilio for sending text messages, or Stripe for sending payments, uh, or even Auth0 for doing authentication. It's because authorization happens in the critical path of every application request. So that means you can't take a 100, 200 millisecond network round trip across the internet to some service. It means that you need to complete it in a small number of milliseconds, otherwise you're blowing through the, 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 the request budget that you have here, right? So it has to be deployed right next to the application. And that's why so many people still have all this spaghetti logic inside of their applications, because it's kind of hard to, to find a better way. Now, so if you are actually extracting the authorization logic, you need that decision engine to live right next to your application, typically either deployed as another microservice in the same subnet or as a sidecar if you're using Kubernetes. But you want to be able to manage all of those artifacts that are used for authorization centrally. Otherwise, it's very hard to reason about everything, right? So for example, what about all this data? The source of truth for users and groups in your organization is typically an identity provider, whether it's Azure Active Directory or Okta or uh, Google Workspace or whatever you're using. And so you want to have a control plane that mediates the, uh, you know, basically getting all of these users and groups and distributing them all the way to the distributed authorizers. Likewise, policy stored and versioned in a Git repository, you want to be able to build those, and then you want to be able to distribute those policy images all to the uh, distributed authorizers. And lastly, we talked about how important decision logs are for compliance and forensics. You want to be able to gather all those decision logs from the edge authorizers and centralize them in your logging, your scene systems. Make sense? Great. So let's jump into actually fixing uh, broken access control. 
So the first pattern I want to talk about is extracting all that authorization logic into middleware, right? So instead of basically expressing all this logic in the route handlers for every, uh, for every route, you'll want to actually uh, have a single place in your application where you do all of that heavy lifting. And in fact, if you look at um, basically what we're doing here, there's a, uh, it's a little hard to see actually, let me switch over to my, uh, my app here. Um, basically, this is the app that we have running right now, literally running, um, it's running under Visual Studio Code. And the first thing that we're gonna do is instead of using this spaghetti logic in this route handler, we're going to, oh, sorry, ah, thank you so much. Please continue to remind me because I don't see what you see. Excellent, all right, great. So let's uh, comment out all this uh, terrible spaghetti code. The first thing that we actually do is we can literally, uh, you know, just make this into a route handler. Now, I'm not gonna actually go run this code because it's a little boring. Uh, all we've done is literally move the code over and added this, uh, here, let me make this a little bigger. Ho hopefully people can see this. Uh, as I get the to-do, um, I'm actually going to uh, get it out of the database based on the ID parameter that I get out of the request. So that essentially means that instead of looking at uh, the owner ID that comes from the request, I'm actually getting it from the database. That essentially solves the problem for all the routes. And what I've done here is instead of using this code, I'm going to, um, you know, essentially kind of uh, delegate the authorization to a middleware. So that's a pattern that's very important to uh, get started with. Uh, that's kind of probably step one in terms of how you get a hold of all these broken access control uh, vulnerabilities. So I'm actually going to uh, I'm going to go to the second uh, pattern here in a second here. Uh, here we go. Go back to the slides. By the way, there's a link here uh, in the slides to a blog post that goes through some of this stuff um, in more detail. Um, we went through this. So the second thing that we can do is instead of expressing that code, that logic, uh, as if we're switch statements, uh, like we said before, we can actually go express it in a policy. So here we have uh, a couple of allowed clauses that, you know, demonstrate how to go build a policy in Rego. And so let's go uh, take a look at that. Um, and then, of course, we're, we could actually, we'll need to go call into uh, that service from our middleware, right? So let's go back to our code. Um, and so here we have, sorry, now it's too big, here we go. Here's the middleware uh, check auth Z that we've re-implemented essentially as we're getting the to-do and all we're doing is we're preparing the resource context for the authorizer uh, the middleware knows to extract the uh, user, the subject, out of the JWT, um, and uh, it knows to formulate the uh, permission as basically some you know combination of the uh, HTTP method, the route, uh, and so it can basically go talk to an external authorizer. And let's actually go look at what that looks like. Um, I am going to. Uh, bring up Topaz. Topaz is, uh, let's see, Topaz is the authorizer that we're using here. Let's make sure it's running. Topaz, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Better? All right, so let's bring up Topaz. Oops, Topaz has started already. Right. Topaz console. Uh, actually, here we go. So what does the policy look like? Make this a little smaller. Here's a set of modules. And so the delete module, for example, uh, this is a simple uh, 
RBAC that's implemented using attributes type of policy. So this says you're allowed if the roles property of the user is an editor and if the key of the user is the same as the owner ID. So this is kind of like the same logic that we had in the if statement just expressed in Rego. And then you're also allowed uh, if your uh, role is uh, an admin, right? And likewise, the same thing happens for this put, um, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, policy for the put API. And uh, we're checking for evil genius and evil genius can do everything, uh, but an editor can only edit their own to-dos, right? Does this make sense as a policy? Great, excellent. So now let's see what happens if uh, I am running this backend and let's go back to the to-do application and see if Morty can run the same trick. So let's try to edit this thing again, get the curl. Here's the curl. Uh, go back to our console, paste it. Now, of course, that's gonna fail. Ah, but this time we're actually failing for a different reason. We get a, a, a uh, response from the authorization engine, forbidden by policy to do app.put.todos.id. And in fact, if we wanna go try to do the same trick that we did before, which is change the owner ID here from Rick to Morty, uh, we get the same failure, right? So we plug that particular access uh, control hole. So far so good? Great, excellent. So now let's say that we wanna go change the policy. Um, right now we have an attribute based policy, but our identity provider uh, has support for users and groups. And a lot of organizations wanna use groups as uh, a mechanism for basically putting people into roles, right? This is an age old pattern uh, that started back in the LDAP days, Active Directory days. You had uh, users, users were in groups and the groups essentially conferred permissions uh, or roles to their users. So that's a fairly easy thing to do without actually uh, changing the application at all. I'm gonna go, uh, I have, by the way, a repo here that, I'll make, uh, that I've made available uh, as part of this talk that, where you can basically do everything that I did. Uh, a word of caution, I'm using a pre-release version of Topaz, so uh, this will all work next week when we actually release it. Uh, so this is a sneak preview, but I'm actually gonna go make a um, build to do reback. So this is going to be a policy that uses relationships between users and groups instead of properties on the user. Uh, and I'm gonna restart Topaz itself. So it reads the new policy. And if I go back to uh, the Topaz console, I look at the modules here. Now I have a different set of modules. Uh, this actually shows the code that I had before, is member of. Uh, and is member of is now implemented as a call to check relation. And check relation is a built in that Topaz adds that basically says, hey, is this user a member of the group that we pass in as a parameter, right? And so now, now we have uh, the ability to um, you know, use relationships, uh, specifically relationships between users and groups. And where does all this come from? It comes from um, basically all the data that Topaz stores inside of it. So for example, here we have Rick. Rick ha is a member of a set of groups. Uh, Rick also has a set of properties. Uh, actually, that's the group, so let's go back to Rick. Rick has a set of properties. And so all of these are fair game to write an access control policy. Now, is this the best we can do? Um, it's not. We should actually be able to go one step further and make that uh, policy basically be uh, completely turnkey for the user. So instead of having any type of middleware that has to remember to fish out the to-do out of the database, we should be able to store the relationships between the users and the to-dos inside of our authorization system. And so here we have uh, what the middleware should look like, just literally super simple, it's one line of code, right? We have a set of uh, object types and relation types that we define as a model, and then we have another uh, clause here, another allowed clause, and I think I have enough time to actually show you uh, the demo of that. Uh, so let's go back to our um, 
our console here. And the console now here, we, we're, we're actually seeing uh, a model and how you can define a model. Uh, you, we have a set of permissions, a set of relations, just like you know, in Google Docs. Uh, so the can read permission, for example, comes from viewers or editors or owners, whereas the can delete or can write permission only comes from editors and owners. So we could define these types of relationships. And now we could actually model these to-dos as you know, if I'm adding another Morty to do, Morty 2, I've run out of creative names here, I can look at all the to do's that Morty has uh, as a set of relationships. So here I have Morty with a set of to do's that Morty owns, right? Excellent. And so now I can actually go make another policy, make build to do uh, global appsec and go make restart. And if I change my code here, I'm gonna basically get rid of this middleware, which does uh, a lot of things that, you know, we shouldn't really need to do, and just use the simplest form of the middleware. This should actually work, and in fact, I should be able to now uh, log in uh, as another user. Um, so let's say I wanna log in as Jerry. Jerry is a viewer in this application. And Jerry can't actually go create to-dos because the policy doesn't allow him. But the new policy that we created here actually uh, allows somebody who's a creator uh, to edit, to create their own, uh, their own, their own to-dos. So I'm gonna go back to Jerry here. Here's Jerry. I'm gonna give him the creator property, save, and now without, again, without redeploying the application, Jerry can create to-dos, and of course he can manipulate his own to-dos but not anybody else's. So that is basically the arc for how to, uh, you know, successively apply these patterns to fix broken access controls. Now I have one minute left, I know, so I'm going to uh, bring this talk to an end. If you wanna go build one of these authorization systems, here's the five, five principles, just to reiterate. Uh, you wanna make them fine-grained, uh, so support any kind of model, uh, RBAC, ABAC, REBAC, or combinations. You wanna make them policy-based, so extract the authorization logic out of the application, express it in its own domain-specific language. You wanna make sure that it's real-time, so you make decisions based on real-time information, but you want all that information centrally managed, and of course, you wanna be able to centralize uh, the decision logs for compliance and forensics. Now, if you're building one for your organization, you also want some non-functional requirements. It has to be easy for developers. If developers it, don't find it easy, they won't use it, and then it's all for nothing, right? So authorization with a single line of code, uh, you wanna be able to integrate with everything that you have, identity providers, source control systems, logging systems, and so on. And ideally, it's based on uh, open source uh, ecosystems, uh, so that gives you the you know, just you know, like, a, you know, basically a layer of, uh, you know, of, of risk management, so to speak. Topaz uh, is the project that I mentioned here. Uh, we like to say that it's fast, flexible, and easy. Topaz does authorization in order of a millisecond. Uh, it's uh, flexible, it supports all the different backs, ABAC, RBAC, REBAC, runs on every cloud, uh, and it's super easy, it's, uh, it has APIs, uh, from gRPC, you know, REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, and SDKs in every language. Um, this is, by the way, the URL. I couldn't find a different place to put it, but the URL for the talk with all the repo in it uh, is github.com, ogazit, global appsec 2023. Uh, and of course, if all this sounds like a lot of stuff to build, it is. Um, Asserto, uh, the company that I work for, uh, builds a fine-grained scalable authorization solution based on Topaz. That's me. Um, my marketing people told me to make an offer to all of you fine folks. Um, you get 25% off your first year if you send us this code. And that's all I have. Thank you so much.